Wow. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas to you. Gosh, wasn't that piece just lovely? What a beautiful transition between the gospel and the sermon. It's so lovely, I've almost forgotten what I was going to say, but not quite. Don't worry. I have notes. <laughs> this is the night. It's the night we've all been waiting for. The shopping is done, it, it has to be. The presents are probably mostly wrapped. How many of you still have things left to do this evening, perhaps, or early tomorrow morning? Yes. I have teenagers at home and I know what I am doing at midnight. Um, I'm finishing up the preparations. But we're into that season where the world pauses for just a moment to breathe, to wonder, and to worship. And here we are, like Mary, like Joseph, like those shepherds who gathered at the manger in Bethlehem. Our story is a familiar one. It's so familiar that in some of the options for readings for tonight, you can start right after the birth of Jesus. You can skip that part altogether and just begin with the shepherds. It's so familiar that in one of our gospels, only two of our gospels actually talk about the birth of Jesus um, in the way that we heard tonight. But the one we don't read most years, that's Matthew, we read from, we read from Luke, um, the one that we don't read actually just skims right over it with just a hint of an allusion to a holy birth. It's so familiar that for many people, the story is something we take for granted, isn't it? In our gospel tonight, we hear of the shepherds learning the good news from the angels we hear of a hurried journey to Bethlehem to see the newborn Messiah. And if we think about it, we know not just of hundreds or thousands, but of millions of people who are gathering around the world this evening to celebrate. Between the earlier service and tonight, several hundred folks will have come together in our cathedral to worship. In our diocese, I expect that tonight we will see more than 10,000 who worship with our congregations. In other denominations and that other, between other denominations and that other diocese to the north of us, there will likely be hundreds of thousands of worshipers in New Jersey alone. In our country, millions, and around the world, well, with well over 2.3 billion Christian souls, not everyone is going to be celebrating Christmas today, or tonight, on December 25th, but many of us do. And we all celebrate the birth of Jesus at some point. That's a lot of celebrating, isn't it? It's a multi-billion dollar boost to our economy. And there's something really wonderful when you stop and think about how many people are connected as siblings in Christ who, who stop and pause and pray as we remember the birth of our Messiah. But I have to say that for all of the attention and celebration that we give to Mark Christmas, that first occasion was not a time of great fanfare. It was a simple birth in a simple place for simple people. It was foretold in the ancient scriptures but it was not something that anyone was expecting at that time. And even if someone had somehow managed to read and understand the prophecies, no one expected it to happen as it did. The child was born to parents on a journey. The mother was young, probably still a teenager, and the family was by no means wealthy. They couldn't afford even enough to secure housing for the night for a mother about to give birth. That's what it means when the gospel tells us there was no room at the inn, that the family was poor and had few options. Because of this, the birth took place in a space reserved for animals. It was warm and safe, but by no means a grand arrival. The baby was wrapped in swaddling bands, cared for simply and lovingly, but there were no royal robes or embroidered apparel. And the birth was announced first to the shepherds, 
one of the most insignificant and lowliest of occupations in the ancient world. By the time that Jesus was born, shepherding was the kind of job you got if you had no other options. It took people far from their homes and families, and it meant that you couldn't be there for your loved ones. Instead, you took care of someone else's livestock, and you were paid almost nothing for it. It was rough work, mostly outside, for most of the year. Did you know that, well, sheep are associated with sleep, right? How do you fall asleep if you can't? You count sheep, right? We associate sheep with sleep. That's, sorry, saying that three times fast. Um, do you know how many hours in 20, out of 24 sheep actually sleep? I was shocked to learn this. They sleep for four hours. <laughs> kind of feel sorry for those sheep moms. <laughs> feel even sorrier for the shepherds because that means there's 20 hours a day when the sheep are grazing. That's why the shepherds spent so much time outside. They would gather in groups, taking turns watching the flocks graze by night. Sound familiar? As some slept. And it was rough work. Remember that line from the 23rd Psalm that talks about the shepherd's rod and staff? The rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, the staff from which we get the bishop's crozier, that large, heavy thing with a hook on the end that I carry in processions, was for herding errant sheep, was for breaking apart sheep brawls whenever the sheep would fight, and the rod it was more of a club for fending off attackers, both human and animal. Can you imagine having to do that as a shepherd? You're on duty 20 hours out of 24. You're poor, uneducated, very vulnerable, and responsible for the well-being of livestock that aren't necessarily going to behave themselves. Their lives were risky and rough, and they suffered from the disdain of almost every other member of Jewish society, and they knew it. And yet there, among the poor, the vulnerable, the rough, and the marginalized, there the glory of the Lord shone, the angels appeared, and the birth of the Savior was proclaimed. Luke tells us that the shepherds went with haste to Bethlehem to see this new thing that God had done. There they found the child exactly as promised, wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. It's a simple story, but it marks the point in time when the timeless Son of God came down for us, and everything is different because of that one birth. My friends, I think this is how God comes among us. Our God comes to us in glory, yes, but that glory finds a home right here with us in the simple facts of human life. God finds a home with young mothers and those who cannot afford adequate housing. God is made known to those on the very margins, to the vulnerable, the rough, and the sleepless. And most of the time, God is made known in simple places, in the quiet moments that mark our human lives. God is made known in family, in community, in connections, and generosity, and care and compassion for others. I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon that the first Christmas came quietly to those whom the powers of the world did not deign to notice, to a young mother far from home, and to shepherds forced by circumstances to tend restless sheep late into the night. And God still comes to those on the margins, to the unlikely and the needy. But God is also born to us in those most unlikely places in our lives, in the inclinations and energy of our hearts, in those gifts deep within us, in the simple places of our lives and moments where we can be vulnerable with ourselves and with each other. I think that's part of the joy of Christmas, isn't it? It's the ability to stop and be still for a moment 
to pause and to connect with one another, to connect with our deepest selves, to connect with our Lord. Christ is born for us. God's love is made known, just as it has always been. In that holy birth at Bethlehem, yes, but also in human life, in those celebrations we will share with family and loved ones, in a message of good news to all people. My friends, the news of the angel is joyful news for everyone. As we gather tonight to celebrate the birth of Jesus, may we find that gift of God's love in the people who are beside us right now, in those waiting for us at home, those who will travel to be with us tomorrow, in our families, our friends, and our community. May we know God with us in the simplicity of human life, in vulnerability, and in all God's people. And may we be blessed with the love, the hope, and the joy of the Christ child, tonight and always. Merry Christmas, everyone. Amen.